what's the procedures for patenting? You know, rule one is try not to do it yourself. I mean, there's books out there uh, that, that, teach, that supposedly teach you how to do it. I recommend against it. In my experience, it takes at least a couple years for somebody with a law degree and an engine, engineering degree to be able to write a competent patent application. And to expect that someone without that background can do that the first time out is just too much to hope for. But, it's, but as an inventor, it's important you understand the procedure for patenting. That way you, you, you'll know what's happening. You know, an educated client is a good client. So typically the first step is to order a search. Don't have to do it, there's no legal requirement, but it makes sense to have somebody in Washington who's a professional searcher go through the files of the U.S. Patent Office and see what other people have done. Uh, frequently, it knocks out the possibility of getting a patent. You know, sometimes you're not first. Uh, even, if, even if it doesn't turn up uh, you know, great prior art, it's good to know what is already out there so that when you write the patent application and try to get a patent, you know what prior art you're trying to avoid. So we generally recommend a search if there's enough resources available and enough time to get that done. If uh, the search comes out favorable, then you file the patent application, which is a legal document, includes a description of the invention and what we call claims that appear at the end. You t if on a mechanical cases, it'll, uh, inventions, it'll include drawings. Uh, there's other formal papers associated with it. There's three things I think you should know with regard to filing application. One is you have to disclose the best mode of practicing the invention. So you can't hold back secret stuff. I've had people come in and say, I've got this new coding composition, it's fantastic, and we've got this secret ingredient, and get me a patent, but I don't want anybody to know what the secret ingredient is. You can't do that. Remember the deal is you teach the public how to practice your invention, you get exclusive rights. So you have to disclose the best mode. And sometimes the decision is made, well, I don't want to do that, I'm going to keep it secret. Next, it's advantageous to file early. In, in foreign countries, the first to file wins. And generally in the United States, if two people are trying to get a patent on the same invention, over two-thirds of the time, the person who filed first is going to get the patent. And the third thing is what we call the Rule 56 obligation. Imagine that the, that the law was with regard to the IRS that every time you took a questionable deduction, you had to tell them that. You had to tell them, well, you know, Rover is really not a three-year-old kid. That's my dog. But I still want the child care. No, you, you know, people don't do that. I mean, I'm not recommending fraud on the IRS, but, but you, you know, to the, when I took tax law, my professor was kind of funny. He said, you know, if the deduction's questionable, take it. If you get caught, try one more time. <laughs> Doesn't work that way in the patent office. There's a duty to disclose to the patent office any information a reasonable examiner may consider important in uh, obtaining a patent, um, you know, to, to reject your application. So as an example, whenever we do a search, we will turn over those results to the patent office. Well, we won't give them our opinion. We'll just provide them a list of the references. And that's your Rule 56 obligations. Now, over 90% of the time when we ask the patent office for a patent, they come back and say, no. You know, it's like a two-year-old, no, no. So you, you, you need to go back and forth with them. And that procedure where you're trying to persuade the patent office examiner to issue a patent, and it can be fairly lengthy and sometimes, I mean, there's cases that literally go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Not very often, but that happens. It's called prosecution. So that's the back and forth. And with a little bit of luck, you're going to get a patent, and you get to pay the issue fee. And the last thing to bear in mind is that's not the end of it. If you want to keep the patent from expiring, the patent office wants you to pay maintenance fees. I think they're at like the three and a half year mark, seven year mark, and 12 year mark. If you fail to pay those maintenance fees, the patent lapses. Who owns the patent? Patent ownership. Remember I said inventors. That's the starting point. But Patents are like any other piece of property. They're intangible, but they're like a piece of real estate. You can sell them, you can transfer them. And with real estate, we lease them or rent them. With patents, we call it licensing. So at the common law, in the absence of a written agreement, if an employee of a company invents something, the employee owns it. Exception, if the employee is hired to invent. Imagine you're Boeing and you hire this employee. Don't get a written agreement and say, you're going to come up with a better propeller. That's your job, and the employee works at Boeing, gets paid for that, uses the resources, comes up with a better propeller. Even with a written agreement, 
there's going to be a requirement that that patent gets assigned to Boeing. If the employee wasn't hired to do that but uses the company resources, the company gets something called a shop right. They get at least the right to practice the invention. But typically, there's a written agreement. And under California law, for example, the employer can require the employee to assign any invention that's made during the working hours or uses the company's resources, or even if the employee does it on their own time at home, if it relates to the company's business, they still have to assign it to the company. You can, do, you can require that in an employment agreement. And that makes sense. Otherwise, you'd have every employee saying, well, although I was working for the company on this project, I did this at home on my own time when it may not be the case. So the law, and that's, that's typical law what California has. Uh, an interesting situation under U.S. law is the co-inventorship situation. And it often happens, you get two or more people working on an invention and, and they're co-inventors. And where that can create a problem is a peculiarity in U.S. law that if you have two owners of a patent, either one can practice the invention or license it without compensating the other. So you need to be aware of that. And if you got, have a company and you have a non-employee working on, on, on a project, you better be sure to get in writing the assignment of the, of the inventor, of the ownership of the invention and any patent that results from it. Otherwise, that, that other person can go out and license it and license it to your competitors and you don't get any part of that money. And that takes us to our last topic. What is infringement? Remember I said inf patents really are the right to exclude. And that's sort of the definition of infringement. It's non-authorized, in other words, there's no license, making, using, selling, offering for sale, don't even have to sell it, just offer for sale, importing the patent invention. If anybody does that, they're infringing the patent, and that provides a right to sue them in court. Now, how do you avoid infringement? Let's say you see a product out there, and you say, this is a great product, but I can sell it cheaper or I, I, I can get into marketplaces that are not in it, I'm going to copy that and start selling it. But how do I know whether or not there's a patent on it? Look at the product. There may be a patent number on it. Patents are available. There's two good resources for U.S. patents. One is the Patent Office website, www.uspto.gov. Another one that I like, because I think it does a better searching job, it's just easier to use, is freepatentsonline.com. Um, if you know the name of the company that's selling the product or the technical people inside it, you can do a search at those two websites by the assignee name or the inventor name to see if there's any issued patents or published applications. Or you conduct a patentability study. Remember the search I said you can do up front? Well, you can do the same thing on the person's product and say, is there anything about this product that they could possibly get a patent on? And if the answer is no, I said, go for it, copy it. And then how to avoid infringement? Um, another way to do it, if you're not using somebody else's product as a starting point, is do what we call an infringement search. It's different than the patentability search. The patentability search we talked about is, can I get a patent on my invention? Infringement search is, can I sell this product without infringing somebody else's patent? And that's a more extensive, more expensive search because the downside is bigger. If you miss a reference on a patentability study, you're out the cost of the application. If you miss a reference on an infringement search, you may get sued with potential damages. Uh, after we, we order an infringement search from the guy in Washington, we then study the scope of the patents found. We try to help the clients design around it. Sometimes there's a published application. In other words, there's a pending application that's been published, and we'll look at that and track that through the patent office and see what patent, if any, they get. And if, in the worst case scenario, if we find a patent, it's a problem, we can't design around it, then we can do a validity study. The patent office frequently issues patents they should not issue. You hope they don't, but they don't sometimes have all the prior art available. It may not be novel. It may not be obvious because of things the examiner did not know about. And we sometimes order a validity study and see if they miss something. So that's it for utility patents. I know that was a lot to cover, but uh, that's the basics. We're moving on to design patents. Now, design patents are very similar to utility patents. The main difference is in what they cover. Utility patents, by the nature of the name, cover useful things. Design patents do also, but they don't cover how things work. They cover what they look like. So, well, this bottle could very well be the subject matter of a design patent. I mean, a bottle's a bottle. This probably doesn't work much different than any other bottle, but it has a different appearance. So you may try to patent that. 
an area that design patents are popular are in furniture. You know, a chair is a chair, but the chairs are made to look somewhat aesthetic. Same with other types of furniture. So those are the type of products we, we, we see getting design patents on. So they cover the appearance of the product, not how they work. Here's an example of a design patent on a, on a pill. Probably, I don't know how well you can see it, it's, it's got a weird shape at the top right corner. It's, uh, you know, it's curved a little bit. Now, why do you think anybody would bother to get a design patent on a pill? There's a good reason. There is a proven psychological effect with medicines that work. If they work, you associate the appearance of the product with effectiveness, and it actually, some people will have a better result from that psychological effect, you know, the mind over the body. So if you have the design patent, the pharmacist can't substitute a pill that looks the same. So you may be able to get a higher price for your product. So what are the requirements for a design patent? Basically the same as a utility patent. It has to be novel, it has to be unobvious. The only difference is it, it, it's covering different subject matter. The cost is much less, but you know, maybe a fifth to a tenth the cost of a utility patent. How do you obtain it? The same procedure. You file an application in the U.S. Patent Office. And how long does it last? Well, I didn't mention how long utility patents last. Utility patents last, in general, 20 years from the filing date. You get to add on to that any delays that are the cause of, fault of the Patent Office. And right now the Patent Office is backlogged, so in general most patents last a little longer than 20 years from the filing date. Design patents last 14 years from the issue date. And how do you avoid infringement? Same as for utility patents. And that's it for patents.